Good afternoon. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge all of the teachers in the room. Um, some of them are my family, the Varky Global Teacher winners. So can I have all the teachers in the room wave and say hello and teachers over here? So it's apropos that we are at an education conference and I wanted to do a, a specific talk about the power of being an educator and giving a voice to the voiceless. And to do so, I wanna share stories of an incredible journey I had with a group of students known as the Freedom Writers. But as I tell their story, I am holding up a mirror to kids in any classroom, whether it's kids in the Ukraine, or in Malaysia, or in London, or any other community, or Oman, any community you may be from. My, my journey of giving a voice to the voiceless started actually with my father. My father wanted me to be an activist. And he taught me lessons as a young girl about standing up, standing up for people who weren't seen, who weren't heard, and great lessons in America about that civil rights movement. Through my father's lessons, I decided that I was actually going to be a lawyer and walk into a courtroom, stand in front of a judge and jury, and then something dramatically happened that made me decide I didn't want to walk into a courtroom. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a teacher. That moment started for me when I watched television and saw this young man standing in the middle of Tiananmen Square, China, standing in front of a tank. And I didn't know his name. I didn't know his story. I just realized that if someone was going to stand in the middle of a square, in the middle of a tank, that it had to be for something that was bigger than himself, whether it was democracy or the right for an education. I, I realized it was bigger than him at that moment. So at that moment, I thought, I don't want to walk into that courtroom, stand in front of a judge, stand in front of a jury. I want to walk into a classroom. I want to walk into a classroom where kids don't have a voice. And maybe just standing in front of them will give them the opportunity to be seen and to be heard. I chose a community in America that had just experienced horrific violence. We had racial riots. We had 126 murders. Babies killing babies. And when my students walked into my classroom at the age of 14, the commonality they shared is they hated reading. They hated writing. They hated one another based on comfort zones and color and creed and cultures. And the only thing that brought them together in perfect harmony was they really hated me, this annoying, perky cheerleader who walked into that classroom wearing polka dots and pearls. As a teacher, I thought that I was gonna have literature leap out of the pages of a book and speak to my students. But in order to get your students to read, in order to get your students to speak, you have to make things engaging and relevant and matter. So I decided that I was gonna play a game that was anything but. This game was called The Lion Game, and it was re gonna resemble what I had seen with that young man standing in Tiananmen Square, standing in front of a tank. It was gonna give my students an opportunity for the first time, those who had been invisible, those who had been on the margins, those that didn't feel that they had a voice, to stand, and in doing so, to be seen. And in being seen, I would know their story. So I took out everything in my classroom that resembled academia. Every chair, every table, every uh, pencil and pen, every test. Put a piece of tape down the center of my classroom. And I was going to ask questions. The idea was my students would come in, they would stand on the wall, and then I would ask questions that would pertain to them. And I realized in order to do so, I'd have to start with questions that had to do with what they did outside of that classroom. After that pencil was put down, after that test was over, after that academic lesson was done questions about pop culture. Because for all of us in the field of education, that's our competition. Every single video game that is live in 3D, or those reality shows, or those Marvel characters that leap off a screen. The hour upon hour kids watch athletes, or actors, or artists, or icons. That's what they know, that's what they care about, that's what they wanna to listen to. So I knew that those first questions had to be about that song, that popular movie that show that everyone was talking about, that hip-hop artist. So those first questions were kind of silly, but it was enough to bring my students to that line. It was this gravitational pull. Stand on the line if you've seen this movie. 
Stand on the line if you listen to this song. And for a moment, my students thought, this woman's crazy. What does this song or this movie have to do with education or me or this class? But at least we're not taking a test. At least it doesn't feel like academics. So let's stand on that line. My hope was that if I asked enough questions about the things that they knew and loved and saw, that those questions could be very serious at some point. So after that line brought each and every kid to that line, I took a deep breath, and then I asked, stand on the line if you know someone who is poor. And every single student, regardless of their shape, their size, that color, that hue, stood on that line. And that someone for each and every one of my students was them. Because each and every one of the students I taught knew what it felt like to be so poor that it hurt, hurt in the pit of their stomach to want things, to wish for things, to, to dread a, a birthday or a holiday because they weren't going to get that brand new pair of shoes, those designer jeans, that new video game that was released. And if they did, what was their hardworking mom going to sacrifice? What was she going to go without? For a lot of my students, standing on that line meant that they knew that it, they didn't have electricity at home or gas to take that hot shower or that warm bath. And at that moment, I realized as each and every student looked up and down that line that they shared something. Even though they thought they were so different and they separated themselves by these comfort zones. So my hope was that I could continue asking questions and those students would continue to walk to the line. Most of the questions I asked started with the word someone because someone gave them an out. Someone could be a friend or maybe a relative or someone in that class. And then I slipped and I used the word you. And, and you was very specific. Stand on the line if you have ever been homeless. And it happened. And it happened so quick. Out out to that line darted this beautiful girl, and she stood there that she had stood each and every time before for this song or, or this movie or this someone or that someone. She got to that line like she'd done each and every time like it was wrote. And when she got to that line, all of a sudden she looked from side to side and she realized, I'm, I'm all alone. And in those seconds, those painful seconds that must have felt like hours, I watched her look at her feet and hope that the floor would swallow her whole. Hope that she could disappear. Hope that I would ask another question so no one would see her. Because if they saw her, if they really saw her, they would see her story. And then that movie started. That movie in your mind that you can't stop, that you can't pause, that you can't eject like you do on a DVD player. She'd seen that movie. She'd lived that movie. And that movie did not have a happy ending. That movie was her life. That movie was each and every moment she woke up and she realized, I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. Or I don't know what I'm going to eat today. And when I come to school, when I sit at this desk, when I see these other students, they look at me. They don't share their lunch. They don't ask me to volunteer, to be a part of something. Do you think they know? Of course they know. And in that moment, those painful seconds that must have felt like hours, she told me later that she just wanted me to hurry Ask another question. Ask another question so I can go back to that wall, so I can go back to being invisible, because it's easier being invisible, because that's what I know. And then suddenly, without saying a word, out of nowhere came another girl, a beautiful girl. She walked to that line, and she looked at each and every one of us in the eye. Unlike the girl looking at her feet, she wanted us to see her, because she knew if we saw her, if we really saw her, it meant we'd seen her story. In fact, we had. At 4 o'clock every day, this beautiful girl would stand on the busiest street of our city, holding a cardboard box. She'd taken a marker from an art class, and she wrote in these big, bold letters, we'll work for food. And she stood there hour after hour, day after day, hoping she could collect coins, hoping she'd have enough coins to stay in some flea bag motel for the night, to be safe, to be warm. And as each and every person passed her on that street, hoping they would see her with that sign, they, they looked away. Or they grabbed their pearls, or they clutched their purse, they crossed that street, they kept on walking. Because sometimes people don't want to see that story. 
And yet she stood there anyways, holding that sign so hopeful. Hopeful for those coins, hopeful for a new day, hopeful for something. At the end of each day, she would collect those coins and she would give it to her father, hoping tonight's the night. Maybe I can have a shower. Maybe I can have a, a hot shower, a warm bed. I won't be so scared. And yet her father would take those coins and he'd use them for drugs. And so at the age of 14, she was out in that cold concrete each and every night. And yet she was the first in my classroom each and every morning and the last to leave. And as she stood there hoping that we would see her and really see her, the lesson she wanted us to learn was, you see me, but this story doesn't define me because somehow, some way, the story's going to change because somehow I'm going to write a different ending to a different story. She said so much by not saying anything at all and by her just standing there. Out came this beautiful boy. He joined them on that line, these two girls, they didn't look like him or talk like him or even come from the same corner of the globe that he came from. But they shared a secret. They shared a story because he too was homeless at the age of 14. And at the age of 14, he felt like it's my fault. I should have asked for something less expensive, something my hardworking mom can afford. In that moment, three strangers came together on a line. Different shapes, sizes, colors and hues, but they shared a painful truth, a painful reality. And at that moment, I realized I walked into that classroom as a teacher, but in that humbling moment, I became a student. And if I wanted my kids to heal, if I wanted them to be whole, then I had to make this a safe place. I had to let each and every kid deal with those stories, those scars, and those wounds. And together, we were going to heal. Together, we were going to put down a fist, put down a handgun, pick up a pen, and write that different ending to a very different story. So I continued to ask questions. And I continued to see kids stand on a line. Some harrowing. Some heart-wrenching. And yet each and every time heroic. Because I got to learn what courage looked like. I got to learn what resiliency looks like. I got to learn that sometimes family is what we choose. Sometimes family is what we make. And with each and every kid standing on that line and standing up for something, standing up for someone, they weren't standing in front of a tank in the middle of Tiananmen Square, but they were standing up to poverty, intolerance, abuse, drugs, isolation. And what they desperately needed was to feel safe, to be included, to be accepted. You see, it's not enough just to, to tolerate somebody. We need to accept them, to embrace them, to invite them in. So each and every question I learned about my students, where they came from, what they knew, what they saw, and more importantly, where they wanted to go. At the end of that experiment, one of the young boys who stood on that line beside those two young girls who was homeless went to a very dark place. He picked up a, a journal I had given him, this marble journal, where I asked him, tell me what you need to tell. And in doing so, write what needs to be written. And he did just that. He picked up a pen, and in that dark, dark place, was able to write about hope, was able to write about room 203, my crazy, chaotic classroom, as feeling like home. And for a 14-year-old boy who should have been hopeless to have hope, for a 14-year-old boy who was homeless to find a home, taught me another valuable lesson, that as this teacher, I have to bring hope each and every day into this classroom. As a teacher, I have to make this safe space a place where kids can feel that it's home, regardless of what they're battling on the outside when they're here. No one's going to judge them. No one's going to push them away or push them down. They can love who they need to love. They can be who they need to be. They can live their authentic self. And as they heal and as they become whole, as teachers, we can open up that door and hope that they can use those wings to fly. 
I never envisioned that those three courageous folks who stood on that line at the age of 14 would be so courageous that they would pick up a pen and write their story. And somehow, some way, it made its form into a book and then into a movie on a screen. And over 20 years, those same young people are a part of my life, proving to me once again that I am just a student. And each and every day, they're my teacher. So I'm so honored to come to Dubai and, and learn from teachers because for the last few days, I've been that student, raising my hands, taking risks, being nervous and anxious, and realizing I could take all of those lessons back to those same students so that we can learn together, we can listen together, and we can grow together. So what I'd like to do in the next few moments is I'd like to open it up to questions and comments about the power of standing. Standing up to that mean girl, standing up to that bully, standing up to anyone and everyone that will push you away or push you down. What happens when you give somebody a voice and they can't contain it? I gave my students a voice and they can't be silenced. They've mobilized, they are now rebels with a clue. They are activists. They are activists who want to change the world one kid or one class or one community at a time. Imagine what it felt like with these same students, those same students who stood on a line to get on a plane, to fly across the globe, to walk into classrooms in Palestine, to meet young people who are not just separated metaphorically, but separated with a wall, and to realize that we needed to build bridges rather than walls, that when we bleed, we bleed red. And when we leave this place, we can still pick up our pen and stand up for someone who may not have the ability to stand for themselves. So I get to watch those kids feel like they're superheroes. They don't have colorful underwear. They don't jump over tall buildings in a single bound. But maybe, just maybe, maybe they can jump high enough that people can see them. Maybe they can shout loud enough for people to hear them. And maybe they can write poetically and powerfully enough for people to listen. So in the few moments that we have together, I'd love to open it up for questions, for comments. Those questions can be about your own community, your own students. It could be about my students, my, my Motley crew, my beautiful crew. Or it could simply be a celebration of why we are here. We are here to celebrate what we do, what we love, oftentimes in a world that reminds us that we aren't as important as we wish to be. I come from a country right now that is, is struggling with a new administration. And to be honest, it's hard. It's hard when I want to stand up for the little guy, the disenfranchised, the people that don't have a voice, when somebody that has a pulpit, a bully pulpit, has become a bully for those that feel less than, for those that might not have the right zip code or nationality, color or creed. So my job as a teacher is more important now than ever. And what I have realized is I don't have to walk into a square and stand in front of any tank, but I'll stand up to a bully. I'll stand up to any parent. I'll stand up to any policy. I'll stand up for what is right, for what is noble, and what is just. And I think what is right and noble and just is what each and every one of us do in this educational sphere. So. So with that, I would love to open the last few moments to any comments or questions. Yes. It would be really nice to know, or if you could share with us where your students are today and how you've had an impact on their progression. For a lot of you that are mothers, when you give birth, you, you cut the umbilical cord. Um, some of you have this wonderful celebration, or some of you might have postpartum. I feel like I gave birth to 150 kids. Um, those students came in as strangers, and they were bound together with a name and a destiny. They called themselves Freedom Writers. I was able to teach them their freshman year through graduation in a community where most of those students would have and should have and were predicted to have dropped out their first semester, that first year of high school. So my students became the first to graduate from high school the first to go to the university. And now they've come back as ambassadors of change. Um, many of them have become teachers 
administrators, and most excitingly, a lot of my students have become folks who are pursuing even higher degrees, PhDs. Two of my students particularly who are pursuing PhDs, both of them have parents who are considered undocumented. Both of their parents came to America from Mexico with an elementary school education, seeking a dream, an American dream. So for Daisy and Oscar to be the descendants of people who struggled and sacrificed, to be able to go and, and pursue that PhD is such an honor. But it's troubling times because people in our country want to build a wall, deport, and I can't wait for my students to have that PhD, to have that doctor behind their name, to give dignity to struggle, to give a name to a struggle, and to honor their parents' struggle. So what my students do now is they are activists in the educational world. They teach teachers how to be more compassionate, to be more uh, empathic, and to, to see those students who often fall through the cracks. Um, those that we send away are the ones they want us to embrace the most. Um, thank you for sharing your story, beautifully told as well. You should do it as a TED talk if you haven't done it yet. Um, I ask about the online environment, because many of these dramas that you've talked about are now lived out in a digital world. And I wonder what experience you've had of helping your students navigate that. In, certainly in the UK where I come from, we're dealing with a lot of challenging issues with those same uh, issues playing out um, away from our immediate consciousness because we can't see what they're communicating to each other. And I wonder how you've used your your experiences and your lessons to deal with that issue? That's a great question. Um, things have changed. Um, as we heard in our plenary session, uh, 2007 was a, a, a magical year in the invention of Twitter and Facebook and all of these things that inundated our youth. Um, things are fast and furious and viral. We could see change in, in a moment in, in Egypt in, in, in the spring when people mobilize and, and use technology for good. We've also seen what happens when people use technology for bad. We've had a spike recently in our country after the election of bullying, of hate crimes. Um, and what I have seen specifically because of our book, we are often a bastion for people who are struggling. So we get that email, we get that Facebook post or that desperate tweet, tweet from a kid who is standing on a ledge, for a kid who's so desperate they would go to a medicine cabinet a kid who is numb and takes a razor blade and is willing to put it to their wrist because they are anesthetized and just want to feel or just want to end it all. So it's horrifying that, that when we were young and, and carefree and people used to bully us, it may be one or two kids. Now when it goes viral, it can be soul crushing. Uh, it can be overwhelming. And so there's been a, a, a really difficult rise recently of teen suicides, uh, of bullying, of hate crimes. And so we've used that digital sphere in the Freedom Rider world to, to say, contact us. You're not alone. Things can get better. Um, and the Freedom Riders who've experienced those issues, some of them had been suicidal, some of them had stood on that ledge or taken that razor blade to their risk. They're that first line of defense in that digital world. We Skype with kids. We send them emails back. We get on a plane and, and fly into their classrooms or we're on a screen talking to them directly. So I think it's important for us as teachers to understand that sometimes our kids need to disconnect, to be connected, to really see each other, to really hear each other, not to hide behind a screen or technology, but to be present. And I think that's one of the important lessons I've learned is that in this global age, we still have to be teachers who are tangible teachers who can touch and see and feel our kids. Hello. Oh. Okay. Go on. Oh. Okay. Hi. Um, so I was a teacher in India fellow uh, for two years, and I taught uh, in a very impoverished uh, community in India. And um, in, over those two years, I could see myself technically growing. And uh, even though I used to uh, try to engage with the community, speak to the parents, and uh, spend a lot of time in my children's houses, I could see not being able to empathize. I wanted to understand them, I wanted to empathize, but I could see that I was not delivering well because I could not understand where they are coming from. And that's uh, primarily why I did not, um, I'm not teaching at this moment because I think I was being unfair to them since I could not empathize with them. Um, and um, my question to you is, do you think this is an intrinsic thing in? a person or do you see it being developed and if you 
and if you feel that if it, one doesn't have it, they should not get into the profession? Uh, uh, that's a great question. Uh, very complicated. Uh, everyone can learn and evolve and feel. And even if we don't look or talk or come from the places our kids come from, it's really important to empower them, to allow them to be that storyteller, to shed a light where they're coming from. Because sometimes that problem or that angst and that anger trumps that technology or that, that term paper. So you have to get to the bottom of why there's a disconnect often. I think that you admitted that you weren't connecting is the most important thing. Um, it's important to admit when we fail, if we fail forward and we get up. It's important to admit when we're wrong. It's important to admit when we don't have the answers. And so I think your humility is so noble because that's how you're gonna learn and grow and, and be a better educator. I, I think that for uh, very compassionate teachers, there is definitely some kind of synergy between them and their students. So I wouldn't leave this profession. Maybe you can have a classroom in a different sphere. Maybe you're a policymaker. Maybe you're a parent advocate. But the fact that you are here and, and amongst all these people who care so deeply about the state of education means that you're still growing, means that you're still a student, and it means that it's never too late. Hi, Erin. Um, I think you, among hundreds of educators here, represent our best and brightest. Um, I think we know that teachers everywhere are getting, uh, are exhausted and are getting wrung out both personally and professionally by a system that's failing kids and failing teachers. And I would love to know what you say to educators um, who we need in front of our students but um, are at that point of needing to do something different, um, and also teachers entering into the education field. For a lot of us, we got on a plane and we flew here. Uh, for me, it was about 16 hours from Los Angeles to Dubai. And for any plane, the flight attendant will come out and she will do a demonstration about breathing. Put the oxygen mask on you first, and then whoever you're sitting next to. Usually it's the child. I think for a lot of teachers, we forget to breathe. We forget boundaries. We forget ourselves in the process. So we become overwhelmed and overburdened, and we're overworked and underpaid. We need to breathe. We need to find coalitions. We need to be lifelong learners. We need to be able to go somewhere that rejuvenates us. If you go to any plug in this building, someone's got their technology plugged in their battery is dying and it needs to be charged. So I'm hopeful, right there, as an example, I am hopeful that this conference is a way for us to breathe, is a way for us to recharge, a way for us to walk away feeling refreshed and rejuvenated, and that it's our responsibility to take that back to others who didn't get on that plane, who are not in this amazing place, to take a little bit of that light so that we can leave a legacy with the words and not weapons to help them feel empowered, to be inspired, and to realize that change comes one kid at a time. If we're going to change the world, it's got to be one kid, one class, one community at a time. So I hope that each and every one of us leave this place with the lessons we've learned, the messages, the inspiration, and hope that br the best and the brightest decided to be in this profession, and whichever way they decide to serve, however they serve, especially you. You can't give up. Now that I know that you were educated, try something new. But don't leave this profession. We need you. We need you. Aaron, uh, thank you for this talk. Brilliant, very emotional. Uh, some tears come. Uh, I'm sorry, I am come from Portugal, very male, you know, <laughs> thing. So for me, it's became Latin, yeah, it's became quite almost naked to say this, so uh, thank you so much to show us once again that we have, we educators and we teachers have the, better, the best job in the world and we can make the difference and we can make the world a better place for our students and like you were saying, uh, sometimes you have to do a small step, but it's a step forward. 
Thank you for everything. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you. In, in closing, um, I love the tears. Uh, as a teacher, as an English teacher, everything to me is a metaphor. Uh, so tears to me is like a cleansing, uh, a renewal, and starting over. And I, ironically, uh, oftentimes when I travel, I, I pick up magazines at the airport, and I spend a lot of time reading about other people and other lives. On this flight, I got to see faces and read stories about my brethren, about these amazing teachers who each and every day walk into a classroom, and they are larger than life, and they stand up for their kids. So I am just one of 150 ambassadors of this incredible movement, the Global Teacher Prize. So in closing, I'd like my brethren, who I have read about, sat beside, and learned from, who have taught me so much about what it means to be a teacher, and more importantly, what it means to be a student, to stand. And in them standing, we're standing in solidarity for all of our students that we serve. So can all of the global teachers please stand? And we can give all of them a round of applause because we are one family. You too. Thank you. As I said, family is what we choose. Family is what we make. So I choose this as my new family. Thank you.